If you have a Bible today and you'll read with us, we're going to take a book, a reading from the book of Nahum, chapter 1. The book of Nahum, chapter 1, and I'll give you a few moments to find that because it's somewhere tucked in those back of the Old Testament, hard to find a little bit. And before we get into our reading today, um, I'd like to just make a few comments. Um, I think today that, and suppose that it's the reason why I preach a lot on subjects related to this, both directly and indirectly. I think Satan has done a wonderful job in our culture today, and especially within the Christian culture, of deceiving us about who God is. Um, He's been at that game for a really long time. We find in the garden that that was a tactic that he employed to separate Adam and Eve from God. And he just plants these little seeds. And by nature, a seed is very small. And so a seed doesn't seem that dangerous. But if you have seeds, even if you pour concrete over it or blacktop over it, a seed will exploit just a small crack. And it will begin to crack that concrete. And that concrete will have water get in there and perhaps freeze and bust it up even more. The next thing you know that whenever it started, it was this clean, smooth, fresh concrete is now all splintered. And if you're like me, I waste more uh, weed killer on my driveway than I do anywhere because there's just weeds all over growing through there. And Satan is vigilant and diligent to, at its core, infect our hearts with things that are untrue about who God is. And the reason he does that, and a lot of times, just like it was at the beginning, Our confusion about who He is is based on true things about God. In other words, it's mostly true. But then there are, at the edges, things that are not true. Or on the surface, things that are not true. And so it gives us this perception of who God is that's not correct. And over time, he seeks to exploit that misunderstanding. And the end goal is that he wants to separate us from God. To cause us in some way to look at God as one to guard against, to protect ourselves from, to distance or avoid And listen, there is a a natural response that when we have sinned against a holy God, we're going to have this response of avoiding Him. But even in that, if we understood the love of God and the grace and the mercy of God, we would inevitably come to the conclusion that the best thing we can do, even when we're in the deepest mire of sin, is just run to God, the very one that we offended. Because God is nothing like us. And aren't you thankful for that this morning? God is not like mankind. As we describe qualities, and we say, you know, people are loving, or people are merciful or gracious, I want us to understand that when we transfer those qualities to God, There's hardly anything alike in those qualities within each other. His are so infinite and transcendent and perfect 
and untainted and unblemished by anything that we mirror as mercy or grace or anything good. All of our goodness is as the scripture says, all of our righteousness is as filthy rags in comparison to the perfect embodiment of those qualities in God. So when I hear a testimony like Brother Gerald just gave, I'm thankful to hear those testimonies about who God is. Because I love to hear God depicted as who He is. That He is great and He is wonderful and there is not one reason that any of us should ever recoil from His presence. Even though what we're going to talk about this morning is something that is, I think, generally misapplied and misunderstood, and it's about the perfect and holy wrath of God. And even in the very subject, there's probably a a sense to which we don't want to hear about this because perhaps Satan has infected it with error. That even in the unpleasant thought is just full of things about God's wrath that are just simply not true. Largely because I think at times the fault of the person standing here, but secondarily also because we see wrath only through people. And that wrath is almost always sinful. And so then when we consider the wrath of God, we subconsciously impute all the the imperfect wrath that we see exercised today and just assume that that is inherent in the definition of wrath because we've never seen it correctly. But listen, even God's wrath is perfect. I want to talk about that a little bit this morning. The book of Nahum, chapter 1, verse 1, it says this, The burden of Nineveh, the book of the vision of Nahum, the Elkishite. God is jealous, and the Lord revengeth. The Lord revengeth and is furious. The Lord will take vengeance on his adversaries, and he reserveth wrath for his enemies. The Lord is slow to anger. And great in power, and will not at all acquit the wicked. The Lord hath his way in the whirlwind and in the storm, and the clouds are the dust of his feet. He rebuketh the sea, and maketh it dry, and dryeth up all the rivers. Bashan languisheth, and Carmel, and the flower of Lebanon languisheth. The mountains quake at him, and the hills melt, and the earth is burned at his presence. Yea, the world and all that dwell therein. Who can stand before his indignation? And who can abide in the fierceness of his anger? His fury is poured out like fire, and the rocks are thrown down by him. I'll conclude our reading this morning. Again, the topic of our message today is the the perfect anger and wrath of God. Now, I want to point out a few things about this text as we begin. The first one is in verse 3. The first part of that verse says this, The Lord is slow to anger. There is a caricature of God that has been created. And it can be embodied in a few of these, uh, um, these sayings that sometimes you'll hear. One of them, if you go to church and you hear about hell and somebody says, well, what did the preacher preach on? You might say, well, he preached fire and brimstone. And what we just read is, is some fire and brimstone. It's a, just because we don't like it doesn't mean it's not true. Just because it's scary doesn't mean it's not true and to be avoided. But I think along with that phrase is implied this notion that God is somehow 
lost control of his temper. That when we read about verses where God is furious, we naturally denote when we hear somebody furious that they have lost control of their senses and they are flying off the handle. But I want you to know today, God has never, will never, and can never fly off the handle uncontrollably with a temper that he can just not control. That is not the God that we serve. All the times where sin is present or all the times where we find God's anger or his wrath displayed, it is not something that God was looking down from heaven. I think very often of, of things. I, just the other day, there was a time where I was in the, live, in the kitchen and I was walking in and, and my little child, Callan, was trying to pour milk into his cereal. You can imagine how that went, right? Next thing I know, there's a whole gallon of milk everywhere. And just my natural response is for just this anger to fly through me. How did this happen and why did this happen and whose fault is this? And I'm going to look to blame you and blame you and all these things that could have been prevented. And there's this impulse that flies through and depending on your temperament or my temperament, there may be different thresholds of how much that anger comes out. But I want you to know that when God looks down from heaven and he sees the sin and the evil, God is never tempted to be impulsive. God's anger is controlled. 100% and perfectly Controlled. The Bible says that the Lord is slow to anger. Now, if we put that in the context of what God sees versus what we see, it's an amazing thing for God to be slow to anger. You see, there's a little trivial situation where milk falls on the floor. And so what is it? About $2.50 or $3 has been wasted about five or seven minutes of my time having to get down and, and clean up that mess has been wasted. And in the scheme of human affairs, something small like that is so trivial, is so small, that it is truly no reason to be angry. And yet, because of the sinfulness of my flesh and the selfishness of my heart, there's this there's this anger that rises up that is natural to me and to you depending on the variety of things and yet it takes much small, such small things like that to trigger us. And yet let's imagine what God sees in this very hour. With 8 billion people all over the world, all of the injustices that are going on in this very moment all the plots and the schemes of darkness to harm, to steal, to kill, to defame, to in greed gain for self at the cost of others. He sees all of the divisiveness of man. He sees all of the plans that man makes to benefit self and to, to, to harm. He sees how people take his name and abuse his name and use his enterprise, the Lord's church, the institution of his church that he's created, and to pervert that. He sees all the harm done to children. He sees all the thoughts of men and women's hearts at all time, all of the arrogance of our minds and hearts, all of the times that we gain and lay up pleasure, we lay up a, 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 a reputation for ourselves that is based upon falsehood. God sees the sins of mankind, and if he was like us, would he not in a moment consume everyone in the world if he was impulsive in anger? But God doesn't because his anger is controlled. Old. God is eternally patient. If God wanted to be patient forever, if God wanted to be long-suffering for all time, there is nothing that he would strive or have to strain at doing to control his temper. His temper. 
The Lord is slow to anger. The Bible teaches us in the book of Romans chapter 2. In verse 5, I want to look there real quick. I won't be able to quote it. He says this. I want to read this in the New American Standard Version. It says this. But because of your stubbornness and unrepentant heart, you are storing up wrath for yourself on the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God. You're storing it up. That God pleads for sinners to come in repentance And when they reject him, and it says there with their stubborn hearts, which implies the fact that they know what they ought to do, that revelation has been given to them. And the previous chapter spoke a lot about that, how God had revealed himself to them. And when they knew God, they they followed him and they surrendered not to him as God. So there is this revelation that has occurred and they know that they're in sin. They know they've offended God and they're in a state of rebellion. And yet they persist in rebellion. And it doesn't say that as they continue to go that way, that God God's temper is getting hotter and hotter and hotter and he's just about to bust through the seams and harm them. But rather what it says is that God's wrath is being stored for the day of judgment. God has control of himself. Because of that, his wrath is not mysterious. You know, this is something that really burdens me as a parent. I don't want my kids to think of my temperament as mysterious and unpredictable. Like they don't know what's going to make me mad. Because God's temperament, believe it or not, it's not mysterious at all. In other words... It's not like I'm living life down here and I'm just in the dark. I don't know what pleases him. I don't know what makes him mad. I'm just walking around and all the while I'm kind of looking over my shoulder and I'm, I'm afraid that I'm going to do something wrong and, and that it's some mysterious thing that all of a sudden he's just going to lash out. God's anger and wrath are very predictable. He spells out in his word what provokes his anger. What a good example for us parents, right? What a good example to say to our child. This is what I expect of you. You ever had a situation where, a lot of parent analogies this morning, I guess. My four boys, there are times where one of them will do something that's just boneheaded. And it just makes me so mad. And I pause for a moment and I I, I sincerely ask myself, did they know not to do it? Like, are they at that age where to me as an adult and perhaps to their older brothers, everybody knows that because they've been taught that that's wrong. But, you know, as you grow up, you've got to be taught even the most simple things not to do. Right, I think coming down here, and I've seen Callan before, he's got about 30 uh, paper towels that he's pulling out. And he's, he's drying his hands off down there with 30 paper towels because he just doesn't like the wet ones, right? But he doesn't realize, no, 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 you can't do that, okay? And so I could walk down there, I could see him doing something like that, and I could just lash out in anger because, you know what? He ought to know better, but the question is this, should he? And so you, I've had those times before where I have to restrain that anger and teach and say, now, the reason why we don't use 30 paper towels is because X. Now, I'm thankful that I don't have to do that with my older boys. But the reason is because it's clear that there's a clear understanding and that if You know a law, you know a rule, and decisively break it. Then you're deserving of punishment. That anger is just because there's knowledge behind it. And so the scriptures paint our God as one who clearly reveals himself. 
He clearly shows himself to people. And part of the value of his word, the primary purpose of the word of God is to reveal God to all people. Why should you be a student of the word of God? Not because you have some checklist, not because there's some guilt imposed on you that, hey, you need to get your chapter reading in today, but because God has in his providence and kindness taken his time to say, do you want to know who I am? Do you want to know the things that provoke me to anger? Do you want to know the things that uh, cause me to find joy and, and, and cause and provoke in me a happiness in you? I want to tell you what those things are. And so he reveals reveals in his word all of these different scenarios and situations throughout time and straight instruction that says, this is who I am. And there is one clear thing that God continuously reveals that provokes him to anger, and it's sin. Sin. That's what God gets angry about. When we violate God's law. And so, if you think, if, you've, if Satan has infected your view of who God is as this caricature, that you've got to walk around and, well, yeah, it's been a while since I've prayed. I probably better do that or I'm going to make God mad. And he might just lash out at me. He might not give me when I, later on down the road I begin to ask him for things that I really want. Well, he's not going to give me those things if I don't placate him today. You know what placate means? See, so I want to say this. God is never placated. Here's what that means. A baby's crying, and you're in some social situation. Maybe you're at the orchestra, and you got to be real quiet. And a baby's just crying and crying. What do you do? Anything you can to placate them, right? Do you want a pacifier? Do you want, do you want candy? Do you want a sucker? Do you want a million dollars? I'll give you anything, just be quiet. But you see, if God is depicted in our minds as this, this being who is about to lose control, he's blowing up because he sees what we're doing wrong and he's angry about it and he's just about to burst at the seams, then the natural things that follow is how we behave about it. And that is, I better do something God likes to quiet him down. And did you know that for a lot of human history, that's how the gods of old, that's what the people believed about them. And so the reason why they gave offerings to a God is because I would come and I'll give this little offering because God's anger has to be appeased. And if I don't come and I don't give this donation to God amongst the Roman gods, this God is going to be angry at me and I need to appease his anger. And I think many people today even under the guise of Christian obedience, they do it to placate the anger of God. God's anger is never and has never been placated by some frivolous, meaningless offering that we can give him. You know, even the Old Testament, people think, well, you know what? What about the sacrifices? Well, I'll tell you this morning, the sacrifices were never to placate the anger of God. As if God was sitting up in heaven and he said, well, if you'll give me 10 more bullocks, then I'll be happy. I mean, think about how foolish that sounds. That God is this little child that's about to throw a temper tantrum. And so he needs for us to give him something that he has created. That he could create a million more of with none of our effort. And yet we've got to give him that pacifier so he'll just be nice to us. That is not the God of the Bible. Even when these sacrifices are instituted, I want to read this to you. It says this, For the life of the flesh is in the blood, and I have given it to you. So God says, I have given it to you. Upon the altar to make an atonement for your souls, for it is the blood that maketh an atonement for the soul. Okay, so this is interesting. So very often, the way a sacrifice is viewed is, I go get my blemish lamb, and I go offer it on this, this altar, and I sacrifice it. 
and now I have appeased God for the year or for the week or for the sin that I just committed and I've rolled back his anger and he's got his pacifier in now until I do something else that makes him angry. But what this is saying is no, that, that it was not us and I think why in the very beginning when God was dissatisfied with Cain and Abel, that part of the reason is because Cain of the strength of his own, that he had gone and he had tilled that ground and he had picked that offering and he had come of his own strength and of his own works and he offered a gift to God that he thought was sufficient to appease God. But what this is saying is no, God is the one who gave the gift of this lamb to atone for sin. So you know what all this was, was a picture God was wanting to reveal to the whole world through all of those sacrifices. I gave you this lamb that you're offering to me just like I'm going to give you the lamb which is named Jesus who is to come some thousands of years from now. I'm giving that for you. You see, God is not one that has to be placated. And listen, lost friend today, if you're going to God and, and this is such a fine line, and I, I, won't, I won't do well. There is a paternal fear in the heart of Christians towards God. Paternal. Now, most people in America today, frankly, have not had good relationships with their fathers. So if you're one of those, it's probably even hard to comprehend what that even means. But a good father is not one that is stirred, is not one that is compelled to lash out over anger because a true father's interest is not himself. It's the welfare of his child. The predominant virtue that governs the heart of a father is not some vindictive spirit that says, you've made me mad. Now I'm going to show you Bend over here and let me get the switch. That's not the heart of a godly father. A godly father, in all ways, is governed by love. Love. Which does not exempt the need for discipline, does not exempt the need for justifiable anger. Listen, if, I, if my children went out and they defied one of the rules or one of the laws of God and one of my rules as a home and one of the rules of Kentucky and I, they just came to me and I was just relaxed and I was cool and I was chill, that would be a terrible thing to communicate them, wouldn't it? Because what I would be saying is that there's no value in these things that have been put forward. There's no value in these rules or laws. But there is a just and necessary anger that is expressed against sin. And a child who has been raised in the nurture and admonition of the Lord, there is a deep respect when crime and wrong and sin is committed even by themselves, that their father is just enough, that their father upholds the law and rules of God and esteems his holy word as sufficient to be justifiably angry at sin. Favoritism today is a very dangerous thing. Listen, if my kid's guilty of something, I don't want to hide him. I don't want to protect him. I don't want to have some kind of favorite preferential treatment towards him. Why? Because it does him no good whatsoever to pervert the laws of God. I want him to know this is right. This is wrong. And there is a cost to wrong that must be paid because paying that cost is right. It's just, and it reflects the eternal design of God. Has God ever been angry at you? You know, he has been at me before. I have felt his disapproval. It's, 
This is where I got to be careful here because I, I, I'm, I'm so unable to, to walk this line finally. When a natural father is angry at their child and they're a good, godly father, that child should never have the fears that they're being disowned because they're not. Right? That a father would look down and say, I hate you for what you've done. That's not a good, godly father. And yet I think that there are many young people, many middle-aged people, older people that grew up perhaps with the father that whether they ever expressed that directly or not, that's what was interpreted. But listen, when there's anger that's expressed that's just anger, a child who is rooted in the nurture and admonition of the Lord never fears that their father underneath the anger does not love them, but it is his love for them that is driving and fueling his anger. Because I love you, I must disapprove of sin. Because sin has a high cost upon you and upon God and upon those you sin against. And so I disapprove of this regardless of who is guilty. All the while the child knowing that that's just an expression of God's love for right and truth and my eternal well-being. Listen, a child, God, he never... He's expressed his disapproval of what I've done. He's expressed his disappointment. You, you've experienced that before, no doubt, where you maybe expected somebody to get angry in their temper and blow up, and it would have been easier to take that. And part of the reason is because you see the sin of their anger, and you say, well, I did wrong, but now look at them. They're doing really wrong. And so it almost kind of eases your conscience a little bit. But what's really hard to take is whenever you've done wrong and you've sinned, and somebody that you deeply respect expresses disapproval. There's a shame. There's a guilt that, listen to me, is healthy and right and good. Because its end game is not demeaning, but to provoke to repentance. Or in other words, to make things right. God in heaven has an anger. It's predictable. It is clearly provoked by sin. And the further a person dives into sin, the more that it makes God's anger kindled. The fire burns bigger, but not uncontrolled. It's not like he's about to fly off the handle. But his anger grows hotter and hotter and hotter. Why? Well, I think part of the reason is because when we know that God's anger is being provoked by our sin and it's getting hotter, it's Him communicating to us, amend your ways. Repent. Come back to me. Here. These judgments all through the Old Testament are not based upon this God who cannot be controlled. But listen, friend, his anger is directed towards sin. Now, here's why that's important in the end. is because Jesus came. Jesus came, and all the sin that had abounded all through time, God's anger and wrath was laid upon his son. Praise God today. You know, when we say we're saved, isn't that what we're rejoicing God for? Is that there is a part of God's character that I will never have to learn in all of its fierceness. Why? Because Christ on my behalf suffered the wrath of God for all men. 
So for every individual, it was poured out upon. Now, I was down at the a courthouse here a number of years ago down in Allen County, and there were, these, there were these, these people that were coming through, and they were standing before the judge, and as the judge was listening to these people, a lot of what he was doing was rehabilitative. It was very good. And they had made a mistake, and they had committed a crime, and he was standing before them, or they were standing before him, and he was saying, well, how are you? How are you doing? And what are your affairs now? As we put you on probation, we want to see how things are going. And one after the other, many of those men primarily were doing better. And his temperament was good, and it was happy, and it was cheerful. And he continued to be merciful because they were demonstrating the fruits of repentance to the judge. And then there was a man that was brought out in shackles. He had been caught violating his probation. And immediately, the demeanor of the judge changed. You know, immediately, the tone of the whole courthouse, everybody changed. I was sitting way towards the back. And I felt different. And yet as the judge began to read off the deliberate ways that this man had violated the clear instructions that he had previously been given. And I began to realize what gross violations of justice and wrong he had done. I found myself in the back wanting to say amen and amen. Not out of some, not out of some sinful spite. But this is right. This is right. Why do we warn people to flee from the wrath to come? That's what John the Baptist preached. Flee from the wrath that is to come. And here's the reason why. Because a perfect, controlled, predictable anger is much more fearful, directed, and precise than a lose your temper, out of control, unpredictable God. That God tells us that there is coming a day in Romans chapter 2 where He has stored up his wrath justly. And all the people of the earth will stand before him in judgment. And he being the just creator calls to give an account for every man, for every thought and every deed, every action that has ever been committed. And God calls them up before him. You go read in Ezekiel chapter 7. And here's the terrifying thing that God speaks to Israel. You stand before me in judgment for the abomination you have committed. Isn't that terrifying? Think I have to give an answer for my sin. You see, I don't need God to be unfair for me to be hurt. All that has to happen is for God to be fair. A lost friend today, saved friend today, I lay before you a God who is perfect, even in his anger, and who will perfectly direct his wrath on that day of judgment. And listen to me, on that day of judgment, when it has been completed, and it tells us that the first one that will step before that is Satan and all of his demons, and he will justly condemn them to the lake of fire. And then all the great men and all the small men and all those that have ever been will stand before him. And when he has completed his judgment and he has expressed his wrath, everything will be made right. God will not have to repent for what he's just done apologize for lashing out. I have to do that often to my children. You know, say, hey, I'm really sorry. I, I, I shouldn't have been that angry. I shouldn't have said those words. I'm sorry. God will not do that. He will not reawaken the lake of fire a million years afterward and say, you know what? 
I've realized now I took it overboard. God is perfect. I'm thankful today that one of the reasons I can trust God is not just because of his love and his mercy and his grace, because even the unpleasant parts of his character are yielded by him perfectly. And for that reason, I can come into his presence even with my gross sin, knowing that our merciful God, that I stand in his hands. This morning, I labor perhaps in vain to lay before you the perfect and holy anger of God. I pray today, understanding this brings me nearer to God, not farther from him. What would push me away from God? And I think what pushes a lot of people away is just not knowing who he truly is. This morning, I pray that the word would be of benefit to you today. Mr. Ashley, will you get for us a song, please? If you feel the need to pray this morning, we invite you to do that. If you need to sit in somber consideration, we invite you to do that this morning. Whatever God would lay upon your heart this, this morning, we want you to follow him today.